All right, thank you very much. So, so we're starting. Um, good day, everyone. Uh, you are welcome to our November um, seminar um, of the seminar series for 2021. And uh, this seminar series is hosted by uh, the Nigerian and the Cameroonian chapter. Um, first, let me welcome you all to Environmental Science Start Borders. Environmental Science Start Borders is an association of uh, students and uh, young professionals under the Center for Diverse Leadership in Science Institute for the Environment at the University of California, Los Angeles. Now, if you want to know more about the association, the website is on the screen. As you can see there, you can visit our website, ESW dot org to know more about um, the association uh of course the association is in ucla and have ch different chapters in uh, different countries um, across africa and other regions of the world uh today i will be the moderator i'm uh, dr ibrahim berusi from the nigeria maritime university data state why my co-moderator is dr lani from the federal investor of technology at Kure. and also we have maria uh, from Cameroon. Now, without wasting uh, much time, I would like to introduce um, our first speaker who is already available to give us the talk for today. Our first speaker for today's presentation is a uh, person of Dr. Zakaria Debo Adeyewa. Dr. Zakaria Debo Adeyewa is a professor of meteorology, specifically satellite meteorology at the Federal Investor of Technology at Kure, Nigeria. He obtained his first degree and second degree in physics and meteorology at the Obafemi Awolowo University, Lefe, Nigeria. He completed his doctorate from the same university under a collaborative funding from Uppsala University, Sweden. Professor Adeyewa served as the head of the Department of Meteorology and Climate Science and later the Dean of School of Science of the same university. And later he was appointed as the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Development of the same university and also later as the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academics. He is the immediate past Vice Chancellor of Redeemers University at the Azinogu State. And during his tenure, the university won several accolades, including the establishment of the World Bank funded African Center of Excellence for the Genomics of Infectious Diseases, which is now a peace setter in the fight against Ebola, Lassa fever, monkeypox, and recently the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I also want to say that um, the African Center of Excellence for Genomics of Infectious Disease is also the first lab uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa to do the complete diagnosis of the uh, uh, coronavirus and also the first lab to map out the genomics of the virus in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, Professor Adeo was, as the vice chancellor, he was the chair of the committee of vice chancellors and registrars of private universities, and also the chair of the association of the committee of vice chancellors of Nigerian University. He was once a visiting professor at the National University Commission at Abuja. Professor Adeo is a fellow and the current president of the Nigerian Meteorological Society is the current director of the, direct, of the doctoral research program in West African Climate Systems of the West African Science Service Center on Climate Change and Adapted Land Use, WASCA, which is hosted by the Federal Investor of Technology and Kure with funding from the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. Prof, you are welcome. Um, I think uh, let me stop sharing my screen so that um, you can start your presentation. Uh, Prof, please, we can't hear you. All right. Now, I've been able to unmute myself, and I hope you can hear me very okay. well now. Um, I, I yes. must um, say that i um, quite honored to be here to make this um, presentation. And so I would want to salute the courage of um, the, uh, the organizers of this meeting, 
I understand you are everywhere around the world. And uh, so you are doing a great job and we want to salute your courage. Um, we wish you, you more, um, more success in your endeavor to ensure that um, we have a global network in knowledge and in science and in excellence. Now, this topic is on raising global champions um, and it's a panoramic um, perspective um, because um, we want to look at every aspect of raising global champions. Uh, and so um, the, I want to again welcome you and to extend my very warm regards from right from the Vice Chancellor of the University, Federal University of Technology, Akure, and also the leadership of WASCA, uh, under which I'm a director for the West African Climate System. Now, the online presentation is going to follow this um, sequence. First, we're going to look at the climate crisis. Then we look at what is climate change for beginners. And then we look at the consequences of climate change. What are the costs of climate change? And then we look at the mitigation strategies. Then we're going to look very briefly on the um, recently concluded um, Committee of Parties uh, 26, um, that's Glasgow 20, uh, 2021. Then we, we ask ourselves, who are climate champions? The very subject of this discussion, and uh, we look at some examples of climate champions at different levels and then we'll consider how we can raise climate champions and how you yourself, you can be a climate champion. Number one, let's look at the climate crisis. The crisis in climate is all over. Nobody's immune to these um, difficulties all over the world, whether you're in the tropics, extra tropics, in the Arctic or anywhere. And so we look at what's been happening, whether you're in Bangladesh on the left-hand side of the panel, or whether you are in Congo, Brazzaville, um, every, the story is the same. People are dying, things are failing, natural disasters are on the increase. And so we face a very huge climate crisis in the 21st century. And many people are saying that except something is done, we might not survive the long-term effect. And so you find that uh, we, we need to ask ourselves, um, for those who may not know what it means, there's a difference between climate variability and cl climate change. Uh, the World Metrical Organization, that's the WMO, defines climate variability as the variation in the mean state and other statistics of climate, that's the weather, the temperature, rain, and so on, over a long time. Normally, we, in meteorology, we look at 31-year average, I mean, 30-year average, before we can say it's a climate change or variability. Okay, so the, the rate of this climate variation actually increases uh, its frequency depending on what is happening in terms of precipitation, humidity, wind, and so on. So we say it's a change when it is not permanent. We see that the variation is long, no longer varying. It's becoming a permanent feature. And the UN uh, FCCC has said that um, a change in climate is attributed directly on related to human activities. We do not have time this afternoon to look at the various activities of man and of um, um, uh, nature. But today we want to look at the global climate change as, as being occasioned by man. And so it's been, it's not longer, it's no longer a dispute that man is the cause. It, we, we, are the, uh, uh, we are the real cause of the climate change we are having now and we are the um, overriding um, um, cause for that. And so we look at, um, people ask, what's the difference between global warming, climate change, and all the rest and so on? Well, it's um, cause and effect, but let's look at briefly on greenhouse gases. These gases are atmospheric gases and they are responsible for causing global warming and of course, climate change. Now, the greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide, water vapor, methane, nitrous oxide, the hydrocarbons, um, halocarbons, and ozone. But um, uh, we have some others that are used in our refrigerators, our air conditioners. We call them uh, hydro 
fluorocarbons or PAFO fluoro, um, PAFO carbons, PFCs. And so these are the causes. And then we look at when radiation is coming from the sun, they are trapped and they are unable to escape into space. They are trapped in our atmosphere. So you, you find how it works here. The radiation comes from the solar radiation from the sun. And instead of the atmosphere allowing them to go through, they are trapped. So you find the kind of thing you had in your car when you leave it in the sun, your, your glass uh, allows radiation to come in, but does not allow it to go out. So you have a trapped energy. Okay. Now you find the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is the major culprit uh, responsible for this. Of course, our gasoline, our factories, and so on, are the causes of this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And they have a residence time in the atmosphere that is quite long. Now, when you look at comparative effects of carbon dioxide in different atmospheres, let's look at that on Mars. The Mars has all this carbon dioxide on the ground. And you find that its average temperature is about minus 50 degrees, just like when you are flying at the altitude of um, 36,000 feet or 11 kilometers in the atmosphere. That is the temperature on the ground of Mars. But when you come to the Earth, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is um, just about um, 0 0.3 degrees, I mean percent. And our average temperature, therefore, is about 15 degrees. When you go to another planet, a very interesting planet, uh, Venus, our sister planet here, it's all entirely, 96% of it is carbon dioxide. And so you find the temperature is about 420 degrees. So the point is that, are we going to be like our sister planet Mars or we are rising towards um, Venus? If we are rising towards Venus, we need to address this change. Now, so the biggest culprit in climate change is carbon dioxide. And we need to do something about that. Carbon dioxide is the most important um, of Earth's long-lived greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And um, even during the COVID-2020, it was found that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was such a huge um, size that um, it, is it is still um, very, very um, um, it's a, it's a huge concern. Now, so if you look at because of these of human activities and a lot of pumping of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere by fossil and other um, fuel and other um, man-made things, um, you find the temperature has been rising and now we are marching towards Armageddon, the red side, okay? Uh, these are the biggest sources of carbon dioxide, the airplanes that will fire, I mean, that will fly, the coal gas plants, industrial processes, um, uh, deforestation, oil production, and all of this, okay? Now, so the consequences of all of this um, uh, are many. One is health. We don't have time to go into this so much. We have um, increased heat stress on the elderly and even the children. And then we have mortality, which affects, uh, includes heat exhaustion, heat strokes, cardiovascular challenges, and so on. Of course, we know that if this is unchecked, it will push us in the next 10 years into Armageddon. And the poverty is going to increase all over the world. And so we ask therefore, what is the cost of climate change? The cost is quite huge. It is better to pay the price of climate change um, mitigation and prevention now. For example, it is known by, that by 2030, um, the global warming will hit over 20, 20 trillion. I mean, look at the, um, the, the budget of the US and you see that even the US cannot, um, cannot uh, deal with this. And so what we are therefore saying is that the cost of climate change is going to be huge, except something is done about this. This is actually showing the effect of climate change and the classification. You find the red zones are more in the tropical or in the Saharan countries. Look at Africa, for example, you see that we have um, the Sahel over Australia. We have things that are going to go out of uh, way. And so when you look at the cost of climate change also is um, loss of biodiversity, okay? And then you find that um, many people uh, look at Morgan Stanley 
have done their calculations. Um, the United Environmental Program has also done its own calculations, and they are all saying the same thing. And also the inter-climate um, change, they are all saying that except something is done, except we can remain at um, 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 at 1.5 or below, we're going to have serious effects. Now, it's good to ask the question. Now, we have a global pandemic now. And I understand that Germany, Australia, they are all asking that our citizens must be vaccinated. In fact, they are closing down their, 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 their countries, like Germany now. Now, so what is the cost of the pandemic versus climate change? The, the cost now might look um, really high for the pandemic. But I tell you what, it's been estimated that in years to come, if climate change continues to be what it's going on now, then the cost of the climate change is going to outstrip at least five times the cost of COVID-19 if care is not taken. So it's going to be five times as deadly. Therefore, we need to look at the mitigation options, uh, carbon capture storage and utilization. We're going to look at fuel switch efficiency gains. We need to look at bio, bio, bio energy carbon capture and storage. We need to look at afforestation and reforestation strategies. And we need also to cut the greenhouse gases, especially carbon dioxide, by ensuring, uh, look at this figure, that we invest more in alternative um, um, energies, like uh, solar panels, um, energy, hydrogen, that is green hydrogen, geothermal energy, and use of ICT to, to do things. In fact, people are already talking about geo, um, Climatology, that is using the, um, geoengineering to change, uh, except, of course, look at Sub Saharan Africa, except we change our path, we are going to be in the doldrums very soon. And these are the, some of the effects of climate change increased frequency of weather, extremes, you know, drought, and even for animals, longer growing seasons, and so on and so forth. And you see also that the greater concern of the impact of climate change is over Africa. It's over Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. See what is happening in all the countries. And look at this lower panel, the lower right-hand side. You find that the population living below the poverty level in terms of GDP, in terms of Afri I mean, uh, agriculture is in Sub-Saharan Africa. We are in the red zone. The other countries, even Asia, is not doing as bad as sub, um, um, tropical Sub-Saharan. And then you look at this also. Look, we depend on cereal in West Africa. And you find that this diagram is showing that except for Mali and except for Nigeria, all other West African countries will be in big trouble. Uh, the effects are long lasting, as you can see here. Now, let's briefly talk about um, COP26. Um, what has happened in Glasgow, we don't have much time for it, just spend one or two minutes here. Actually, the, 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 the goals were high. The expectations were high. That the countries, for example, were being asked to come forward with unambitious, you know, unambiguous, you know, very ambitious 2030 emission targets to deliver and to speed up and switch to electric vehicles, encourage investments and and so on. And also to adapt, adapt to protect communities and natural habitats. And of course, the global community made a huge promise some years ago that by 2020, the developed countries are going to um, help the developing countries by $1 billion per annum to help finance the effects of climate change so that we can march together. And then for to work together to deliver um, the climate crisis. But of course, um, you and I know what has happened now. These goals are not as um, expected, but anyway, we are matching forward, but not as expected. For example, if you look at climate finance, you find that um, the developed countries actually promised, pledged to give 100 billion to um, developing countries by year 2020. That is still for, uh, falling short. And so the goal is to hit 100 billion. Are we going to reach it? Let's hope that's going to be the case. And so, when I talk about climate champions, which is the subject of this um, discussion, now the question is, who are climate champions? Are climate champions just um, the likes that you have had over the, over the years and over time? 
where can we look for them? Are they only in Germany, in Sweden, in Africa? Where can we find them? How can we raise them? And so climate champions are climate visionaries. These are brilliant people who are passionate around the world, not just in any particular part of the world. They are passionate about providing solutions to the climate crisis that we just mentioned. These are people who around the world are working to find the solutions. And um, they are individuals who believe in sustainable means of doing business in their own communities. They start from their communities, all of them, as we mentioned them. These are champions who are part of the change and sustainability engagement around the world. Now, I, I mentioned some of them, they are, they are examples. Uh, these ones are in Scotland, okay? They are called the Young Farming Climate Champions. Who are these young farmers? They are young farmers who are driving climate, uh, climate um, uh, change initiatives. And they are farming people in the Scottish, they are Scottish farmers, and they are making positive changes to their own businesses um, to increase their, their biodiversity and to also ensure that they, they, they work as farmers, as crofters. Now, crofters are those who, um, unlike the natural way of doing things, they must, uh, they, they, they get to the farm and feed their, 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 their animals on a particular place, um, you know, in, in, in a quite, in a, in a massive way, and then leave the land to uh, recover for biodiversity and all this for a longer time. So these are people who are working. And if you look at them, they are quite young. See, I've captured here some of the females among them. These vehicles are being driven by, by them and reducing efficiency, I mean, increasing efficiency by reducing the number of hours or journeys that these um, vehicles make. And they are looking at alternative energies. Now, they also uh, feed their animals on grass and allow the land to rest. So they, they do a lot of things, improving their soil health. They also improve grasslands with more grazing like I've just, I've just discussed now. Also, you find that uh, they plant trees and sequestering carbon as well as create shelter and forage for their livestock. They, they do quite a, a lot of things to make sure that uh, um, uh, they are moving forward. They're using energy, using biomass, they even use solar panels for their energy use and so on and so forth. Okay, now some of the examples of climate change champions. This time we go into the Arctic region. We go to the Canadian Arctic. And this young man of 34, Dana Tilza Trump, is an example of a passionate climate champion. He's the youngest chief of Yukon, which is about 80 miles beyond the Arctic Circle in Northern Canada. He's leading the fight on climate change. And you see, they are really impacted by climate change. And um, this reminds me of the fact that I did my PhD program in the Arctic Circle, in the Swedish Arctic Circle, about um, uh, several kilometers beyond the Arctic Circle in Northern Sweden. So I understand perfectly what they have been going through. Things are no longer the same. For example, if you look at the, sh they call it the shifting Arctic, the Arctic Circle that we enjoyed in those days. I mean, you, you are guaranteed of white Christmas, the Aurora and so many things. We love the Arctic, but in this particular place, the Arctic I mean, region has become less predictable, you know, in terms of uh, migration of things. So the farmers, I mean, the hunters could no longer hunt the animals and some birds, the, 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 the salmon and all this because of the fact that things have um, changed. And so, I mean, they, they also have seen that um, uh, the people who are called the people of the lakes, the lakes are disappearing. I remember Lake Panitras. This is a lake of about 10 kilometers wide. Imagine that lake being defrozen. Imagine the super permafrost and all this disappearing. The joy of the Arctic land. So this is what is happening to them. And because of the increased temperatures, it has led to wetter conditions and the permafrost is defrozen. Many things are happening. And so one study actually found that such catastrophic drainages became more frequent in the, in the, in the few, I mean, in the last 20 years. And so this people rose up and this climate champion rose up and said, look, I'm gonna do something in my own um, region. Uh, you know what he said? In 2019, 
you know, he became the first indigenous peoples in Canada to declare climate emergency in their own region. They declared climate emergency, a move that actually brought them to limelight. Not only in Canada, he has also become a global voice in climate change. See what he said, you know, they set a target of reaching net zero greenhouse gas by, by 2030. Imagine people living in the Arctic. Just look at their um, solar farm, I mean, solar energy farm. Look at those of us who are living in the tropics. We don't even have as much as this. He has to clean the snow and all this from his, um, um, his uh, solar farm so as to, to do it. So you find also, he says something. He said, nature speaks to us, just that he's not speaking English. Do you, do you agree with me that nature is speaking? It's climate is speaking. Um, men are speaking, women are speaking. Even the ground, our yields and waters and so on are speaking. They're not speaking English. They are speaking international language. So climate change is now an international language. So you find also, I want to give an example of, um, a good example of global, um, of a corporate climate champions, an example of WASCA. And WASCA is West African Science Center on Climate Change and Adapted Land Use. Okay, so um, WASCA um, is um, a West African Science Service Center uh, for climate change and adaptive land use has been uh, is, it was established in 2012. It was endorsed by ECOWAS in 2014, and I tell you that the um, the government of Germany through BMBF, their research and education has really done a lot to sponsor this far away in West Africa. To we to this uh, we, are, we are very very edu uh, uh, grateful. So the the, the what's called is educating is building services is also building um, capacity in terms of resilience of human and environment systems. And like I said, it's funded by the German Ministry of Education and Research, BMPF. Now, it is a West African um, initiative, um, but we also have another one in Southern Africa, it's called SASCA. So we are called West, WASCA and they are called SASCA. And WASCA seeks to become one of African leading science-based institutions in provision of climate services, raising climate champions. Now it is hosted in all the um, ECOWAS countries that have signed on. For example, we have climate change and agriculture in Mali, climate change and water resources in Benin and Benin Republic, climate change and biodiversity, Cote d'Ivoire, climate change and um, land use, um, Accra, I mean, um, um, coming from uh, University of Sciences, Ghana, uh, climate change and energy, Niger, climate change and um, I mean, West African climate system, that's our own university here in Akure, Futa, um, climate change and human habitat, MENA, also in Nigeria, climate change in economic Senegal, the Gambia, Lome. So you find that the, this, um, this uh, institution is raising climate champions in all of West African countries, except few. And um, what is happening is that research is going on, education is going on, extension services to agriculture and other things. Our students are all over. Each of these graduate um, 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 study centers is training PhDs and is liaising with um, stakeholders. So WASCAL is actually developing effective land leadership in climate science. And then um, again, you find some of the victorious um, uh, things here. These are our own here. You find them across West Africa. So what is happening is that you find the achievements of these um, graduate schools, okay? We, we have produced a number of graduates and professors are many across the countries. So we have produced people who are now working in the FEP, uh, C, um, uh, WMO, and, FES, and FPCC. I mean, you find that already Waskal has achieved a lot, okay? Now let's keep these uh, local issues here and go on to women. Women are leading the fight against climate change. And I'm happy to note, we just mention some of them here very, very quickly. Who are these women who are leading the struggle, the fight against climate change? One of them is Christiana Figueres, you know her. She's been part of, she's been secretary, she's been talking, she's been sweating, she's been working day and night in the United Nation framework for climate change. Uh, since um, July 2010. So she's in diplomacy. 
And that's very interesting. And then you look at another one, Rihanna Gunright. She deals with policy. She's 33 years old. I mean, we're looking at this so you can look at your own age bracket, where you fit into this. She's a climate policy director at the Roosevelt Institute, and she has worked in so many places, educated at Yale, and in fact, she's the director of climate policy in, um, in, in research and interested in climate policy changes and so on. So she's, a, uh, she's looking also at racial quality and all this when it comes to um, climate change. The third person is Hilda Hain. She's 70. She's not a young woman, but you know, she's still fighting uh, for women and for climate change. Now, currently she serves as advisor and a member of the multitasking forces committees, and she's chairing the Human Resources of Health Task Force and so on. She's the founder of Women Rights Group, Women United Together, um, um, uh, Marshall Islands. So she's looking at governance because, you know, she's been working with senators, she's been working as an, a, 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 a political figure. So we find these people everywhere. Uh, look at this, our sister in the, this our sister, of course, she's been working in church. Uh, she knows about the church, how it has dried up so severely. And so she is an environmentalist, act, an activist. She's also a geographer. She, um, she, she talks to her own people and she has been participating uh, in the Conference of Parties, uh, 2021, 2022, and so on. So the interesting thing here is that she has even received some awards because of fighting for climate. So her own is indigenous activism. All right, you look at this one also. She uh, is a, a scientist. I like this because we're talking about climate science. She's a modeler. She's also into climate communication. She's teaching people um, in NASA about climate change and what we can do about climate change. And so she's talking about hot planet. Uh, and and the, of course, everyone knows about um, um, this, our daughter or young woman, a greater thumb back. She's only 18. She's turning um, 19 just um, next year. And she's um, a Swedish environmentalist. And I don't know, you know, she speaks so well. She speaks very, very good English. Uh, maybe she wanted to be an environmentalist. So she, she learned English because um, I, like, like I told you, I swear, I, dwell, I mean, I, I studied in Sweden. They are not very, very French, but she's very French. And she was the one who said, how dare you joke with our future? How dare you talking to people? And so when you see her, she looks so calm, but look, she's very, very good. She talks about school strike for climate. All right, okay. Then you find some other women. Now, it's so numerous that we can't talk about them. So despite all the hesitancy, many things they say about women, they are battered by climate change. They are the grassroots. They are the ones having, you know, the, the, the real effect of climate change are being, but being, being affected by these women. And look at this example, Masura Parvin. She's the unit leader of Cyclone Preparedness Program in Bangladesh. You know what she said? She said, I can do the work of 10 men alone. People say, I have no fear. During the Cyclone Bogo, she was the only woman who volunteered and even all the men respected her. She could carry babies, she could carry, you know, when a woman is doing something, she does it with all her strength. So these are climate champions. And I want to see this. This lady that I just talked about, Masura, actually is one of the numerous women across the world who are doing something so that um, we can know that they are working. On, you know, they are, she's part of the untold women climate champions all over the world. And they face the climate because they are, they are close to the ground. So unfortunately, the climate change in the climate change arena, women, and not so many. That's why I've given these examples here. You find that it took UNFCCC 20 years to allow women through the gender program, Lima, to, adv to advance uh, their own party now, but thank God, now we have uh, parties who have agreed um, since COP25 that Lima can come online now. Okay, now the critical roles of women in climate, it's so much, and we still have some gaps. For example, you find that their roles have been declining for some reason, one reason or the other. For example, we had 38%, um, 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 and then we had 35%, and now they are reducing. But we can get more women to raise black climate champions. 
I challenge you, do you have a sister? Do you have a wife? Do you have a mother? She can be climate champion. And when they do it, they do it all with all their passion, all their energy. And, and so we need to raise climate champions. We need to raise climate champions. We need to raise weather, what I call weather warnings. When the weather goes awry, when we have um, extreme weather that like we are having so many times now, not just in Africa, all over the world, maybe snow or something, these people are out there, they are out there to help. Then we also need community champions. Who are community champions? These are champions, climate change champions. They are working right from the grassroots of their own communities. Of course, they can work on COVID-19, they communicate, they help people, they look at the, 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 those who are unable to do something, disabled people, they encourage them. And so they, these are community champions. Then we also have health champions. Because of climate change, we have a number of health challenges and people are dying. Who are the health champions? Who will go over the local radio, go on television and talk about it. These health champions, they offer, um, um, uh, they raise awareness and talk about supporting their networks. They engage, empower and motivate people. Of course, we can even have street champions. I do not know the number or the, 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 the color or the name of your street. In that your street, they can be street champions. The, the young men can begin to do something about these young women can also begin to work right on our street. Uh, I, I think Telephone Government UK is doing something about this. Our own local government also can do something about this. And before I finish, I want to say that everyone is welcome to be a climate champion. These are the activities, whether you are doing research, financing, capacity building, okay, advocacy, whether you are engineer, technicians, we all can be scientists, students, industrialists, farmers, inventors, you know, government, whether you are in government or something, we all can be climate champions. On this note, I would like to say thank you. And since Christmas is just a few weeks to come, I mean, I want to say Merry Christmas in advance. Thank you for the opportunity and God bless you all. All right. Um, thank you very much, Prof, for your wonderful presentation. Um, this is really uh, quite uh, interesting. Um, so I want to ask the audience, if you have questions for the first speaker, please, uh, you can use the link on the chat box. <laughs> And go to slide over so that you can ask questions. Okay, I think now I will um, ask Maria to do the introduction of the second speaker. Maria, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Abraham. Good evening, everyone. Good morning. Our second speaker is uh, Dr. Eric Nana. He's a conservation biologist dedicated to finding solutions that work best in conservation in Africa. Uh, I think he will present himself before the presentation. The title of his presentation is Gendered Aspects of Wildlife Trafficking in Africa, the case of Cameroon. Please, Dr. Eric Nana, can you present yourself and your presentation? <laughs> Is Dr. Okay. Eric Ahara? Dr. Eric? He's okay, muted. Hello. hello. Yeah, I couldn't hear you. So you have to mute me. Thank you. Okay, okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so thank you for inviting me to take part in this forum. It's quite interesting. I mean, the first presentation was also very interesting. So I'm Dr. Eric Nana. I'm doing a postdoctoral research here in West of Oxford right now. So I'm working actually on one score that affects biodiversity in Africa. It has to do with the bushmeat, the wild meat crisis, which you know is a very serious issue because not it deals with not also the decline of biodiversity, but also a public health issue. So my presentation will be to try to look at the dimension that I'll. Can you get me, please? 
Yes, Dr. Yaga Tinyo. That's what I was saying my presentation is like to try and look at the dimension that has been somehow overlooked up to now, the gender dimension that is the role women play in this crime that is increasing and getting a lot of importance globally. So, to share my screen. Okay. So we said I was focusing on the gender dimensions of wildlife trafficking, and I'll focus particularly on what we call the bushmeat, the bushmeat trade. You know, bushmeat is like at the heart of today what we call the emerging infectious diseases like Ebola and the COVID-19, which is believed to have been transmitted to humans in some bushmeat market. So you see, it's, a, it's an issue of global importance. It's not just for biologists, but for conservationists. It concerns everybody. That's why everybody should know about it and should know exactly what's the way forward, how important it is, and exactly what roles women play in it. So as I said, so I'm a researcher at the of Oxford. I'm also a researcher back in Cameroon. I work for the Agricultural Research Institute for Development. I work in a wildlife research unit. So my presentation, I'll look at like six critical points, the scale of the bushmeat problem in general, and the different trafficking routes. They look at the main driver, and then the lessons learned so far, because so several interventions have been carried out, a lot of money is being spent, has been spent over the decades. But why is it that is failing, is not able to have the desired reach. And then now we look at the gender dimensions, that is the roles women play, and then some policy recommendations, that is the way forward, what should be done about it. So to start briefly, if we look at the scale of the problem, we realize that wildlife trafficking, as I said, is a conservation scourge for decades, because it devastates a white population has contributing to the sixth mass extinction. You know, we've had five mass extinctions, and this is the sixth one. And the bush meat trade is actually contributing a lot to it because many species which are threatened and at the brink of extinction are particularly concerned, like rhinos, like pangolins. Unfortunately, many people enjoy eating, but they don't understand that this species is the most threatened in the world. And not just animals, even plants. Like for example, if you had take like hardwood species like the African zebra hood, that is another highly threatened species, and even ebony, and a wide variety of other species. So if you take, for example, the case of the pangolins, I like to talk of pangolins especially because pangolins today constitute the most trafficked terrestrial vertebrates in the world. By 2013, more than 1 million pangolins had been trafficked. By today, we definitely get more than 3 million. And nobody knows exactly how many individuals are left in the wild. So there's a serious problem. So if you look at pangolin seizures, you see that it has increased by more than five folds from 2007 to 2018. That is, in the space of 10 years, we moved from less than 30,000 individuals trafficked. That is, the seizures. So just the individuals that were found, but for sure, the other individuals that get through loopholes which they're never able to detect. So just based on seizures, it has increased five folds from less than 30,000 in 2007, to 2018, to more than 140,000. I mean, in Nigeria recently, one of nine tons of pangolin skills were seized. That represents one of 36,000 animals killed. Can you imagine the, the scale of the disaster? And these animals are pretty, pretty critical roles to maintain ecosystem services. But not also that. Many of these animals also reservoirs for terrible viruses. So that's to trying to understand the roles all these animals play. But unfortunately, by the time you understand actually the intricacies of this web of life, many of the species have gone extinct. That's why it is very, very important to understand exactly what are the drivers. And the push trade appears to be a main driver. If you look at the trafficking routes, we we'll see that Nigeria in Africa is actually at the heart of this trafficking. And this trafficking is organized in such a way that you have dangerous criminal syndicates 
they're not organized around it. Because you know, when you have a lot of money that gets into something, definitely you have dangerous individuals or getting as well. So you look at the trafficking route, you see that traffickers are used for different forms of land trafficking, being buses, being trucks, even sea, and they channel these products to Nigeria where these dangerous syndicates get them. At times, some members of the syndicates go to neighboring countries, they go as far as the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, to bring the products to Nigeria. And then you have now syndicates that come from Southeast Asia, from Vietnam and China, to come buy from Nigeria and take to Asia. So you see the main driving force behind all this is because of the so-called Asian Chinese traditional medicine. They believe most of these products, rhino horns, pangolin scales, are aphrodisiacs or can help cure certain diseases, which has never been proven scientifically. But I understand why people still so much, I don't know, get into this issue so much. It's unfortunate. But then we can see that the scale is driving, I mean, it is driving the extinction of this local species. Then we look at it on a global scale. You see that the products live from China to the United States. And an interesting study found that actually Germany in Europe plays also a pivotal role because many of the products that leave Africa go to Germany, from Germany they go to China or Vietnam, then from there they go to America. That's if you look at the map in front of you, you can see that the thickness of the lines are correlated to the number of individuals pangolins, because there's maps of pangolins that have been transported. And also the double arrows indicate final destinations, whereas single arrows indicate transit routes. So, I mean, it's really interesting to see that in Germany, people buy so much pangolin. So the question you ask here, is it that Germans and other Europeans alternatively have an increased taste for pangolin meat? Or is it in America, Americans, spend a lot of money in conservation for also interest in the family. The answer to this question is that the African diaspora is found in Europe and the Chinese diaspora found in America for driving the trade. There's a, an increasing bush meat trade from Africa to Europe, not because the Europeans keep bush meat, but the Africans were there. This were all the livestock, chicken, beef and all that, but they still go for bush meat. That means there's an issue with bush meat which goes beyond monetary dimensions. And these have to be explored. So the main driver, as I said, of course, is the money you need. Over 10 years, international donors spent about $2.3 billion to try to fight the traffic. But every year, that traffic generates close to $23 billion, you know, 10 times the amount of money that was spent over 10 years. I mean, there's so much money inside. You can understand now why it is difficult actually to curb that trade. Comes that difficult. And we have so much money, definitely becomes dangerous. So that's why today it is known that this trade now is full in the global crime stream. That is after narcotics, counterfeiting, and human trafficking. It is now wildlife trade. And very soon, wildlife trade will come first, that is, by the next 10, 20 years. So it's a very lucrative business in which criminals are not deeply involved. And the unfortunate situation with this wildlife trade issue is that it's not just the local people that are more dependent on bushmeat for just livelihoods, but they also have some powerful untouchables who are into it. That's people who already have money. But they see this as an opportunity to make even more money. And so the instrument they use local people to get the products and pay them pretty up nothing. And they now through their channels can sell the products to China and other Asian countries and they make a hundred times more money. So really unfortunate. So this powerful and touchy was a known well case. I mean, of a colonel was the summer banned by the US. The department because it was established that he was the main brain and the main person behind the trafficking of elephant tusks and pangolin skills from Cameroon to China. He and his family were banned, but that was just a symbolic gesture. 
because it was banning into into United States, definitely I'm not really affecting and does not affect the trade. So law enforcement should try to do more in order to stop the trade. But the lessons we can say that I learned so far with this wildlife, wildlife trade is that it goes beyond conservation issues. It concerns everybody. It has become even an issue of national and regional security because you know the cases of terrorist organizations like Boko Haram who do poaching in areas that they attack, get elephant tusks and rhino horns and sell to these channels to get more money to put an attack and kill more innocent people. There's a well-known case in 2014 of rebels that crossed through Central Africa into Cameroon and a national park called Bubajida and they killed in a space of a few hours 400 elephants. They had heavy machine guns. Rangers can't face such people. So you see the scale of the issue it's gone beyond control of rangers. So it's not just rangers now of a fight. You have to get military and military commandos to get inside. So it's becoming really a national security issue. And also, as I said, because of the untouchable people get inside, it somehow is a barrier that impedes local development. And also, it's a source for emerging infectious diseases. Right now, we'll see how the Ebola and also the COVID-19, some affecting world economy, even circulation around the world right now is not very easy. You want to move from one country to the next. There's a lot of headache and need to go through, a lot of restrictions. And just imagine if the COVID-19 was little as the Ebola virus, that would have been terrible. So now people understand that this issue of the wild meat trade, or wildlife trafficking is not just for biologists. It concerns everybody. That's why everybody should be involved in it. So the next thing I wanted to know, apart from the fact that it's a time bomb, is that conservation community has never been so well equipped to fight this wildlife trafficking today. But why then is it not, why they're not able to stop it? For many reasons. There's poor governance, there's corruption. When those on the, on the side of law enforcement are poorly paid, I mean, just take the case of some local rangers in Central Africa. If you look at the monthly wage, it's not up to 200 pounds. Some even get as low as 100 pounds, about $150 a month. They expect them to feed themselves, to pay their bills, their families need to take care of, and all that. It's not possible. So they are just not motivated, actually, to try to fight against the traffic. On, on the contrary, they become even corrupt. So because they get money from these traffickers and they let them go away. So the issue is a very, very serious one. But here now, let's try to see why so far, when we talk of wildlife trafficking, it appears to be like a crime of hegemonic masculinity, like a crime dominated by males. Is that the case? So I see on TV, or read on social media, most of those who are arrested usually see they are men. So is it that women are not involved or they play a minor role? Or is it simply that women are more clever? They want to get around law enforcement. That's why they can't get them. Actually, a few studies decided to study out to investigate this issue. And they found that this gender dimension, I mean, it is still an avenue to be explored by students especially the students who have here in Africa, in the, in the developing world. And that data is still largely unavailable. But then there is no indicator that can somehow identify trends and make inferences for decision makers. So we really need more studies, but a few studies have found that the groups of individuals involved, be it from origin to final destinations, are always defined by gender as males. So they never, they never talk about women inside, which is a serious issue. But a recent study published in 2020 found that women actually play significant roles in this traffic. And there are six primary roles and up to 32, 35 secondary roles that women can play in the traffic. In other words, whereas women are the driving force, it's just like the Italian mafia with narcotics, in which Usually men who are seen, they started to show that actually the brain behind are the women because they raise the kids and they 
inculcate the Marxian ideology into your brains. So the men are either after in jail or die very young, or so they're never at home. But how come your kids grow up and all follow the same rule? So that's what from that. And it's the same thing now in this wildlife traffic. And so the primary roles that women play they can be offenders, that is women or people who actually do other with poaching or do the sell the products, they can be defenders, those on the side of law enforcement, being on the government side of civil society, they can be influencers, that is kind of romantic partners. But we know that wildlife products like bush meat, they confer in certain societies prestige and social status. So women who prefer men who can like provide them bush meat or can get Source, financial resources from such products. So that influence the local men to dive into it. You have observers, which are like almost the rest of the society, all those who observe, who see the traffic, but do nothing, say nothing about it. You have then the people who are armed. These are like family members of traffickers who are jailed, and if they are reliant on this source of income, finally, they're left to fend for themselves. And I see also that they have benefactors, that is the consumers, who actually benefit. And then across all these roles, it was identified that in certain areas, the most important role that women play are those of offenders, and least important people harm. Whereas in certain other areas, we found that women play important roles as defenders. So there are many roles that women play. And in Cameroon, for example, you see that women make up 84% in more of those who sell this wildlife product, especially bushmeat, because they are talking talk about bushmeat in urban cities. And by the turn of the century, close to 90 tons of bushmeat were sold every day in urban centers. Big cities like young day. I mean, you can imagine how many animals you have to kill for that. But then, the income generated by these women realized it somehow empowers the women because it enables them to cover intermittent needs, send kids to school, it makes them less reliant on men, therefore they get more respect for men. Also, it was also realized that the women in this trade, they tend to be, I have to say, they tend to control the trade because your demand affects the hunters who supply them. The more they ask, the more the hunters go to the forest and kill. So in rural areas, about more than 40 percent of women are found to actually sell bush meat. So it's a livelihood issue at the same time the power of to one. As I said, it gives men economic independence. And so the fact that it's so highly valued in rural areas and even in urban areas, so we can say it has a high social value. And so the question we can ask here now is that should bans on bush meat be implemented? Or should we reduce the volume of the trade? Or should we find another way forward? So that's the main question. Because if we put bans and then actually reduce the volume of the trade to a very significant level, then all of these women and their families who rely on that source of income will be affected. We've allowed the trade to continue the way it is. There's a biodiversity that will get completely decimated and the whole world will be affected. So we find ourselves in the dilemma what to do. So we can recommend and make some few recommendations for decision makers. It's true, there's not enough data actually to give solid policy recommendations. But there are few data available for the Nebulas will recommend that we need to revise current wildlife laws because the actual laws are outdated. And unfortunately, many of the wildlife laws in African countries, especially in the Central African countries, are still in line with the colonial past that consider local people as a problem in conservation and not as a solution. And then the social psychological context it's never considered in most of the interventions. For the interventions, you don't look at the monetary dimensions, you don't look at non-monetary aspects as well. So 
proper law enforcement, of course, is needed. We want to secure the threatened species, but also we need to make sure research can determine the number of species which are not threatened and which can be used in the trade, and how many of these are found out of protected areas so that hunting quotas can be set so that the trade can be made sustainable. So, of course, including women in such interventions and including women discussions put in place such policies is imperative because they are central, they play pivotal role, as we see, in spreading the trade. So, our end year was a short presentation, but at least I hope the message went through and open to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation, Dr. Eric Nana from uh, Cameroon. I think uh, now the floor will be open for question and answer sessions um, for both speakers. Uh, I think I will um, ask Greg to anchor the question and answer session. Greg, over to you. Hello. Um, so I'm going to start with the first first questions that I'm seeing um, here, and um, Dr. Nana, are, are you able to uh, to stop your screen share? Sorry, can I take that. Okay, I'll I'll see. Take them again, please. Here we go. All right. So hopefully people can see the questions here. Um, so the first question uh, comes, I believe this is um, for Dr. Adiyawa, um, and it says, as energy needs of the world rise, should we focus on the actions of individuals um, or larger corporations in our attempt to mitigate climate change effects? I think that question is to the first presenter, not me, that is on climate change. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. We'll, we'll we'll be addressing both both speakers um through through this question session. But uh, we're, I, I think we're going by how they came in. So uh, I think the first few might be for Dr. Adiyawa. Okay, please, okay. please, 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 please. Can you come again? Um, I didn't get that question quite well. Um, can you come again on that question? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so it says, as energy needs of the world rise, should we focus on the actions of individuals or lar larger, larger corporations, excuse me, in our attempt to mitigate climate change effects? Well, uh, thank you. Let me just say that individual efforts will not be good enough. As we raise climate champions um, on our streets, in our backyards, in our families, we can do our bit, but the corporate efforts are very, very important. For example, coal is a major issue um, that um, is driving carbon dioxide and climate change. And we find that China um, is the biggest offender in this and is selling its products to many parts of the world. So if your government provides energy to you through coal or gas or some other fossil uh, fuel and something, it's be difficult. So. We need to move from the individual level, the family level, community level, state level, national level, and even the regional level. For example, in West Africa, German, Germany is sponsoring green hydrogen energy so that we can transist into using of green hydrogen. Because the use of blue hydrogen is not good enough. It's been found recently that blue hydrogen, I mean, when you convert um, hydrocarbons to, uh, to fuel, you, you, to, to, uh, to hydrogen energy, you still find some methane in it. So the, the simple question is that this is not possible. We need to do it at the global level. We need to do it at regional level because you and I, we are affected by what the government does, what the local government does, what the international community does, what the advanced countries does. So that is why COP26 was such an excellent place to um, risk climate champions. Thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, we have a second question 
for you, Dr. Adiwewa, Yewa, excuse me. Um, how can we raise our young children to be more aware of climate change? I believe you might be muted. My mic is okay. Okay, now yes, my mic was muted until now. That I was allowed to unmute. Now, the truth of the matter is that to catch them young is so important. If you look, look at that eighteen-year-old girl, she actually started from her home. She was taught on what to do and so on. Then she took it to her school, and now she has become a global feature. Um, so. We need to start from the family level. We need to start to train our children. You find, for example, in some countries, it doesn't matter at all what you do. I remember as a researcher um, in the Arctic, my supervisor would tell me, no, this is um, in the forest, in the Arctic, um, snow everywhere and so on. But you are not allowed to throw things around. I mean, you, you take care of things. So our children should be told how to do things properly. Um, um, what to do, how to reduce the carbon footprint, how to uh, use the bike, how to eat foods that are um, healthy, how to say, how to uh, become climate champions. In fact, your daughter, my daughter, your son, my sister, they can all be raised to become climate champions right at the kindergarten level. So um, we actually proposed, we were at WASCA level, we made a proposal not too long ago to have a grant so we can affect the curriculum of the primary, uh, the kindergarten and secondary and college students. So we can build this into, into them and then attack some prizes so that when a young girl of 12 or even five begins to know about climate and begin to ask climate, then we give her awards. The same with boys. We have seen now that both boys and girls have to be brought in this. So absolutely, the family level is the best place to start this program, training our young babies. Um, I'm not saying they should not cry because crying does not affect climate anyway, but we're <laughs> talking about what they can do, what they must not do. So the climate crisis, because they are going to be the beneficiaries or the ones to suffer climate change in the next um, 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 years to come. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Um, I think there are a couple more, um, and at the 15-minute mark, I'll definitely get, get a, a question for, for Dr. Uh, Eric Nana as well, um, if, if we haven't seen one. So uh, we have a question here from, I believe it's Bukola, uh, Ogan Tuase Osagi, and he says, thank you, Dr. Adeyewa. Um, afforestation was mentioned to be one of the ways to address climate change, but we now know that plants emit methane. Um, so what can we do? So if, we, if we're, I think they're saying, if, well, I'll let you interpret it. <laughs> uh, okay, let, let me address this issue of uh, reforestation because now all we are having is deforestation. And I want to appreciate our colleagues who are into biodiversity. They are into forestry and into planting trees and so on. We are all tools to plant trees. Reforestation is the goal. Um, so you plant, some trees at your backyard, in your, in fact, there are now climate change um, um, agents or climate change um, activists who are starting from their own backyard, their own compound to plant uh, trees, to plant flowers and eat their own things and so on. They go for organic things. This is part of the climate change issue, but it has a limit. Even if we reforest, I mean, if we plant trees, it has its own limitation. We should, of course, like it's happening in Amazon and so on, plant as many trees as have been cut down by women, but we need to even go into another advocacy. For example, in Nigeria, um, where I'm speaking from, the cost of gas and other alternative energy um, sources of um, cooking and um, energy has gone up. And women are going back to cut trees and to use coal and other something. So we find that 
We need to do something about this. The government will have to do something about this. But our research has also shown that suppose we want to plant more trees in the Sahara Desert, for example, we want to plant trees so that that place can be reforested. Um, we use some modeling and it is shows that if you do that, if you plant some trees in places where there are no trees now, so that the whole world will look um, green, there will be some repercussions. In fact, it won't work because we need those places as deserts. They are the heat sinks of the world. So energy um, arises from the tropics and the sink in the subtropics where you have the Kalahari, the um, Sahara Desert, and even the deserts in, the, um, in China, in um, Australia. What we're trying to say is that if you try to change that natural setting, if you want to reset the bottom, what we found is that climate will change and places that are wet now become dry and you bring a lot of difficulties. Remember that many people are dwelling in the, I mean, in the tropical regions where there are rivers and so on. The rivers might dry up. So it's a complex situation. So geo engineering also is being talked about. What can we do? Apart from planting trees, can we go into the atmosphere and spray some dust to capture, um, to, to ensure that we don't have heating in the atmosphere? Some of these things also have their own side effects, I must say. So the best thing is to allow nature to go the way it has been allowed to do. Don't reset it. Just do your own bit in planting trees, but don't make it um, so wide that it becomes um, a problem even to um, the, the, the art itself. All right. Um, so I, I want to ask one more question before I, I move to a question for, for Dr. Nana, or Dr. Eric Nana. Um, and um, if there are more questions a little bit later, we can, we can address those as well. On um, this last one, um, it says, is there uh, any role Wascal uh, is playing to resolve inadequate climatic data um, to embark on implied research uh, on a local scale? So is, is Wascal playing a, resolve, a role to uh, resolve inadequate climate data on a local scale? Yeah, yeah. Let, let me answer that quite quickly. Uh, Wascal is set up for um, to build um, capacity in terms of uh, training scientists. And also in doing so, we do a lot of research. Our, our students, our graduate students are doing research all over West Africa. And there is a particular place, there is a particular segment um, that is in uh, Ouagadougou, where we have um, uh, what we call um, um, a data bank where we harvest data from all our meteorological stations, water resources, and so on. So we are doing a lot of things on data. If you look at it, sometimes you don't have data at, on the global map over Africa in particular. It's a data sparse country. What we are trying to do is to, um, uh, for example, now people are getting data from the internet, or from satellites, and so on. But it's better that we get data from our local environment data on biodiversity, data on degradation, soil change, and so on. All of these are being done by Waska. And the center, the competence center at Ouagadougou is looking exactly at data management. We have a lot of data in our servers over there and the data is being networked so that those who want them can use them just for climate change. I hope that uh, answers the question. And somebody is also asking if I may just answer this. Are there scholarship opportunities? Oh, the scholarship opportunities are numerous. In particular, we're looking for women. We don't have enough women who are coming on to WASCA programs. And I want to tell you the good news. If you're a woman, the, uh, I won't say the standard, but um, we make sure that this course favors you. So we look forward to, we just had the batch five students now in WASCA and on behalf of the WASCA um, um, headquarters in Accra, I would like to say that you're most welcome. However, the next chance will come in, the new, in a few years time because the one for this quarter has just closed recently. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna move on to a question for, for Dr. Eric Nana. Um, so 
the first question, I, I think you, you answered this at a, uh, a later point in your talk, um, but if, if you could readdress this question, it says, uh, why is Nigeria such a hot spot for trafficking and how can this be mitigated? Dr. Eric, are, are, are you available? If you're speaking, uh, you're currently muted. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Well, why Nigeria is like a, at the very heart of this, this traffic, maybe population size in Africa. I mean, I mean reasons, but actually we have no data to actually explain why Nigeria is at the heart of it. And maybe also Nigeria is like I said today, the main economic driver in Africa. So that can explain why many activities, either positive or so negative ones, that are centered in Nigeria. But it's just things we've observed that's under we still need to learn a lot on just wild meat trafficking in Africa. There's still a lot we don't know. So this is one of the reasons, one of the questions we're trying to answer. Why is it that is in Nigeria that some of the pivotal points in Africa? So what can you do? There are many things that can be done, as I said. We need to revise, first of all, wildlife legislations, because wildlife legislations currently, they don't somehow favor, or they don't like channel interventions to act in the right way, because the legislations are more for strict law enforcement, but we know strict law enforcement actually does not work for the past two decades. That does not work. So you need to work more with local people. We need to empower local people. Because there's a big issue on it is that there's poverty, one big issue. But also, as I said, on the other side, you have these dangerous criminal networks with powerful intentions. So corruption is also one serious major issue. So it's kind of complicated to try to curb this wildlife trafficking. But when the first step would be to revise the local legislations and empower local communities to have like local customary rights and traditional control at local levels. That can be a good step. But there's no silver bullet I can really tell you that can really solve this issue. Because it's just like narcotics. So that's the question. Why is it that despite all the money that's been spent, we still have all these criminal networks in narcotics? It's the same thing. Uh, is that another question for me? I'm sorry, my sound cut out there for a moment. So I, I, I was I was trying to listen to, to see if there was there was more. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so a second question says, uh, in reality, can the roles of conservationists still be effective to combat this ugly menace? So I think you you were uh, addressing that a bit in, in the last question. Um, I'm not sure if, if you want to uh, talk about conservationists in particular. Um, and I, I, they also ask a second question, kind of uh, leading up to that as well. Um, it, is it conservationists or politicians that we should really be focusing on? We should focus on, focus on both, actually, especially politicians. You see, the main reason why wildlife trafficking is not in the national accounting systems is because it is done by conservationists and scientists. And so policymakers and decision makers in government they don't actually see the relevance of it in economic development. That's why it's not taking, they don't take care of it. So they don't consider it an issue, a major issue for development, which is not. That's a problem. So actually, conservation is not just for biologists. Even decision makers and policy makers should be involved. So actually, it's non, mostly the policy makers and decision makers in government and those in parliament that we should be addressed, that we should actually put your attention to it, because they are the people who take the decisions. They are the people who put laws, and they can bring the change. All conservationists can do is get, get the data and channel to them. All right. Um, and so um, we have another question. This one's from uh, Christelle Njuege. Excuse me, Joe 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 Ego. My apologies for mispronouncing your name. Um, 
and uh, they say, uh, uh, Dr. Eric, do we have data so far on what is the final usage of bushmeat markets in the African diaspora in USA or Europe? Actually, there's no data to get like the stats of the bushmeat trafficking in the United States. So there are a few studies that have carried out in Germany that try to show like the scale of the, the issue, but there are actually no studies of like presented stats to show it. There's like an increasing, they're just like beginning to discover to uncover actually that traffic because I've been going on for a long time. And the more Africans we have to settle in these areas, the higher they, that trade is going to go, gonna go. So I can tell you currently, we don't really have any data, but what we know is that the traffic, especially the bushmeat traffic from Africa to Europe and Asia to America, is mostly because of the diaspora that's there. They're the ones driving it. And definitely they don't have any food security issue because they have enough to eat. There's enough, there's enough alternatives. Bit of sickle for bushmeat, then it means the non multi dimensions that have to be accounted for. And that means the study. Okay, and we have. But, uh, oh. I can take one last question. Unfortunately, I have another meeting. Uh, yes, as you say, there's actually one last question um, that, that just arrived in the chat. Um, it says the data presented on wildlife seas between 2007 and 2018 showed five fold increase in 2018. How do we justify a lay to a layman that despite trafficking, the animal population continues to increase? Or the, the animal, I guess, trafficking uh, uh, continues to increase? That is why trafficking the animal population continues to increase or to decrease. I'm um, sorry, can you say that again? Sorry, I mean, from the question, is it trying to ask why is it that this by the trafficking, the animal population continues to decrease? It means. I, I don't, I, I can't, uh, there we go, there we go. I don't know if you can like, rephrase the question, because actually it's a population decrease in threatened species and all species, and that's the main issue. If the population of animals increase, then that would not be the problem. The problem is because it is depleting wildlife populations, pushing them to the brink of extinction. I don't know of the, you can rephrase the question. Um, it, 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 I don't know if you're seeing what 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 is appearing in chat. Um, they're they're saying that it appears as though there's no decline. Okay, in you. I'm sorry. I'm not sure going to get you, Greg. Oh, I I was saying um. I'm not sure if you can read read the chat. Um, the, they were saying that there's just no apparent um, and uh, there's no apparent decline or apparent decline in the animal population, um, and it seems as though with trafficking they're not affected. Um, even with more more of the animal population trafficked in 2008 compared to 2007, so I'm not sure if that's if if it's just an. I think they're asking is it an apparent decline or if this is an actual I think, decline. I think I lost. I don't know, this must maybe some connection problem because I didn't get anything you said in break. I don't know if it was on my side or on your side. Um, I'm not sure either. Can you uh, get me? I, I think I think that they 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 were <clears throat> they were just asking um uh if if they're if the decline uh in animal population if it was apparent or if it if it was an actual decline. And and I believe you said that it was an actual decline. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, one, one other question that we had um, in the chat uh, for Dr. Adiewa, um, I believe. Um, are there opportunities for students and professionals from the field of wildlife ecology to explore and, and lend you studies through the West Coast Scholarship Program as well? Um, and so I think that this is the last question that we had um, in total. All right. Um, let, let me see the question again. I can't see it here. Can you see it? Um, 
Yes, my apologies. Um, so they were saying, um, are there opportunities for students and professionals from the field of wildlife ecology um, to explore and uh, land use studies oh. through the WASCAL um, scholarship program? Yes, uh, WASCAL has um, so many um, channels uh, through which it's educating people. You see, climate change has so many sides to it, economy, biodiversity. For example, in Cote d'Ivoire, the specialty is in biodiversity. So in every form, except law for now, um, whether it's the science of it or any part of climate change, we have opportunities. Uh, I, I like to say this, even when a program like ours here um, in Akure, Futa, is dealing with the science of climate change, that's the meteorology and climate and all this, we still deal with some other, other aspects that are not at least scientific as such. So when we bring in the students, we train them, and then they also bring in their own perspective. For example, somebody who's into chemistry could come here and talk about the issue of um, atmospheric chemistry into um, climate change. So if you are doing biodiversity, you can also come. we we'll look at it. And that's why we allow people to come from different backgrounds because now climate change is not just about um, one narrow perspective. So there are opportunities. So if you contact us, uh, when we have the next uh, opportunity, we'll tell you where you can apply. And even if you apply to us and your area of interest is not being covered, we can refer you to other um, areas in, in the whole West African system. It's a singular sponsor that is German, the, uh, the German government. And so we collaborate so that um, everyone comes in and we can deal with climate change in a, can I say, a panoramic uh, perspective or multidimensional perspective. So everyone is, well, is welcome. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Um, I think that that was the last question that I, that I uh, saw. If, if I didn't get to your question, I apologize. Um, I know that we're getting towards the end of the meeting as well, though. And so I, I want to turn it back over to Dr. Abraham, um, and uh, I will let you close it out. All right. Um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Greg. Um, um, first, I want to thank uh, both speakers. Uh, please, I don't know if we can have the emails of uh, um, the speakers so that uh, we can display it on the screen, or perhaps the speaker can just uh, read the email out loud. Um, for Dr. Eric, uh, he, he just sent me, I think he has stepped out because he has another meeting to attend. So I'm going to put his um, email address on the chat box. Okay, Prof has also put his email address on the chat box. So for Dr. Eric, I'm also putting his email address on the chat box. Uh, Profone is debo at gmail.com. Why for Dr. Eric, he's uh, ericnana2000 at yahoo.com. Because if you see from the chat box, it seems uh, the interaction is still ongoing. That we may not have time to address all the issues and concerns that um, all uh, our participants may likely raise uh, in the course of this program due to time sake. So I think, uh, okay, Prof is also adding his, uh, his official, um, uh, other than his personal email address, he's also adding his uh, uh, official email address. So um, you can reach both speakers um, as a follow-up. Prof has uh, indicated that a lot of opportunities uh, especially for for women, so it's I want to encourage um, our, our, our participants, we have friends, students that are interested in climate change issues. Why not? Prof will be available to um, to speak to them. Also, you can reach Dr. Eric, who has just uh, uh, jumped out of this meeting. So I want to thank both speakers again, and I want to thank everyone in the audience for finding time to join us for today. In fact, it has been very very interesting. I myself I have a lot of questions I want to ask both speakers, but for time's sake, perhaps I'm going to email the questions to them. So, Prof, once again, thank you very much for, for coming. And uh, it was really a wonderful presentation. Uh, we are very, very grateful. And uh, hopefully, we look forward uh, to future interaction with you and uh, perhaps also with uh, the WASCA as an organization. I think. Uh, 
with that, uh, we've come to the end of uh, the meeting for today. Thank you very much for everyone for finding time to join us. So have a nice uh, and wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. We are grateful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye.